So welcome, uh, welcome to Unsync. So what I'm going to do for the next 45 minutes or so um, is take you on a bit of an adventure through the solar system and explain some of the work that I do here in Dunsink with my planetary research group. So the image that I'm showing behind me, lots of you will be familiar with. Okay, hands up anyone who's seen an image like this before. I'm hoping everybody. Okay, so this is an image of the solar system. So we've got the fiery dynamic sun at the center. And then we've got the four terrestrial rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then we've got the two gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And I'm mostly going to focus on those today because they're really at the core of my research, but I'll, I'll touch a bit on the others as well. And then we've got the two ice giant planets, Uranus and Neptune, about which we actually know very little, um, but we hope in maybe the next 20 or 30 years to go to at least one of those with a spacecraft. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit about my background and how you become a planetary scientist or a space scientist. So I'm from Limerick. Uh, I went to the Crescent. Maybe some of you have played rugby or hockey against the Crescent in the past. Um, we were a big rugby school, actually. So I went to the Crescent in Limerick and I did a whole range of subjects like you guys. Um, I did transition year and then picked my leaving search subjects and I did physics, of course. Um, but I also did chemistry and geography and music and French. And actually, the diversity of those subjects, I think, really helped me in my career path now, because, for example, doing English really helped me with my writing. And that's something that's part of my day to day job. So it's not just maths and physics that's required to be a scientist. You need to be able to communicate. And also my French is quite useful. Don't ask me to speak French today. Don't test me. Um, but I have a lot of French collaborators. So that, that's actually really, really handy. So I would encourage you to think carefully when you're thinking about your subject choice and to think about doing things that you enjoy, but also having a sort of diversity in your profile. So after school, um, I went to university. I did an applied physics degree in the University of Limerick. And part of that degree was a nine month work placement, which I did at the Mullard Space Science Lab, which is part of U University College London. So here I am pictured with a pretty dodgy haircut um, back in the year 2000 on my co-op work placement. Do you have a question? No? Okay. So during that time, I worked on a mission called Cassini. Hands up anyone who's heard of Cassini? Well, at the teachers mostly, okay. So Cassini, you'll hear about it again in a little bit. That was a mission to Saturn. It was a NASA and European Space Agency and Italian Space Agency mission. And it was just really amazing as an undergrad to have an opportunity to work on a huge interplanetary mission like that. And that really convinced me that space science was definitely what I wanted to do forever. So then I graduated um, with my applied physics degree. And here, here's a picture of um my class so there are about 25 of us in the class and just to give you a sense you know this lecture is sponsored by the institute of physics and to give you a sense of the kind of jobs that you can do with a physics degree all the people in that class some people work for intel um in leak slips so they work on semiconductor physics some people uh, work on medical physics quite a few people work on building medical devices there's a couple of people who work with x-ray instrumentation and a couple of people who work with optics for endoscopes, um, for medical imaging. Somebody became an accountant, don't really know why. Um, somebody else became a professional guitarist. He was always amazing at that, but a whole range. And then quite a few people who've gone into the software side of things and become software engineers. So physics gives you a really broad base and gives you a lot of flexibility to do many, many different careers from being a pure physicist, uh, an academic as I am, to weather forecasting to any kind of numerical um any kind of job that needs a high level of numerical skill so after the degree i went on i moved to the uk and i actually lived in the uk for 17 years so i did a phd um, in the university of leicester and that phd was working with data from this mission to saturn and then i lived in london for a decade 
and I worked at Imperial College London, uh, here it is in this image, and then University College London, and then ultimately the University of Southampton. So here I am pictured with my first ever PhD student there. So my jobs when I was living in the UK range, included a range of things. So space science research at the core, but also lecturing and also mentoring students. And now I work here at the Dunsink Observatory. So all my research group are um, sitting upstairs. They're ready to come down and give you another tour at the end of this lecture. Um, and I, I have a whole group who are made up of PhD students and postdoctoral researchers. And they work on a range of things. Some people work on Mercury, some work on Earth, some work on Jupiter, some work on Saturn, but primarily using spacecrafts to understand and quantify what's going on in our solar system. Okay, so hands up anyone who has knowingly observed Jupiter in the night sky. A couple of people. Great, good. So Jupiter, it's it's not actually um, well, clearly not visible at the moment. It's very cloudy today. But Jupiter is a really great starter object to observe in the night sky because it's visible without any instrumentation. You can just go out into your garden. You can download a whole range of different free sky mapper or Stellarium or whatever apps on your phone, and you literally just point your phone up at the sky, and then it shows you on your screen what you're actually looking at. Okay. So Jupiter is a great one to observe. And what's also great about Jupiter is that you can see a couple of its moons, which we call the Galilean satellites. And we call them the Galilean satellites because they were discovered by an astronomer called Galileo back in the 1600s. So here on the top left, I'm showing you an excerpt from one of his um, lab books, essentially, where on successive nights, and you can see he's, he's got slightly dodgy handwriting, but he's written the dates there on the left. And he observed Jupiter which is the open circle, and then he observed these moons orbiting either side. And so they, these moons orbit quite close in. And so on successive nights, they might appear on different sides of the planet. So it's a really nice one. Um, if you're just beginning your, your life um, as an amateur astronomer or indeed a professional astronomer, you can get a view of Jupiter really quickly without a really fancy telescope. But the image here on the right was actually taken with the Grubber factor, which you've just seen and operated here in Dunsink. So you can obviously get a much better view when you've got a really nice telescope. And we run open nights here throughout the winter. So if you were interested, you could certainly come back and, and have a go at observing yourself. But what great as it is to observe from the ground, it's even better, of course, if you can go there. And so we've now sent lots of spacecraft to Jupiter um, as back as far as sort of the 70s. And then we've had a couple of spacecraft which have flown by on their way somewhere else in the solar system, and then a couple of spacecraft that have orbited. So the first spacecraft to orbit was the Galileo spacecraft, um, named after Galileo. Right now, we have a spacecraft called Juno, which is a NASA mission, which is at Jupiter right now. And we've gone from these kind of images on the bottom left, which are still were stunning at the time, but that kind of a resolution from spacecraft like the Voyagers or from Galileo through to this kind of resolution now in the bottom right. This is an image from the Juno cam, which is the, the um, visible light camera on the Juno spacecraft. And just the detail that you can see of Jupiter's great red spot and of the swirling cloud patterns in the atmosphere is, is pretty amazing. But as I said, it's great to observe from the ground, but it's even better to go there. But planning a space mission is really hard and it takes a really, really long time. So I won't ask you to guess my age. Um, I'll just tell you. Um, so I'm 41 um, and I'm the same age as this mission called Cassini. So this is the NASA and European Space Agency and Italian Space Agency mission that I mentioned. And this was one of the most successful interplanetary missions ever designed. So it was initially thought of back in 1982, which is the year that I was born. So the Americans and the Europeans got together and said, we really want to send an orbiter to Saturn. How are we going to make that happen? And so they spent 15 years discussing and deciding and planning and building instruments and testing instruments. So here is the, the, the spacecraft, which has all been integrated together with the high gain antenna at the top, which is the communications antenna to send data back to Earth. And you can see a couple of standard size NASA employees, probably slightly taller than me. Most people are, most adults at least. Um, and that's in the vibration testing 
uh, center at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. And then here it is on the launch pad. And here it is post launch. <clears throat> so from 1982, 15 years of planning and building and testing, and then launch, and then seven years to get to Saturn, and then 13 years at Saturn. So basically a 35 year mission. And we're still analyzing the data from Cassini now. So <clears throat> why I kind of labor the point about the dates is that for the next generation of missions, it's you guys who are going to be analyzing the data from those because they take so long to plan and build that it's it's people like you who are in school right now. If you decide to go on and have scientific careers and do and degrees, maybe in physics or computer science, and then go on to do PhDs, the missions that we're planning today to go to the outer solar system, those data sets are going to be ripe for you guys to analyze them um, when you finish all of your studies. So one of the other things that we need to do when we send a spacecraft to, to any planet is to um, set our mission goals effectively to, to go, like when you go to the supermarket and you have a shopping list of what you need to come back with, that's exactly what we have when we go to a planet because we have a set of mission goals or science questions that we want to answer. And we design the trajectory or the flight path of the spacecraft in the best way possible to achieve those mission goals. And an example of that is the Juno spacecraft, which is at Jupiter at the moment. And Juno is on a particularly daredevil trajectory around Jupiter. So it, it flies, this is this purple line, which I hope you can see, which turns yellow when it gets close to the planet. So it goes really, really close to the planet. So right, just right above the cloud tops, getting a really amazing view of Jupiter's atmosphere. And then it cuts through the magnetic field lines here, and we'll come back to magnetic field lines in a little bit, um, and gives these amazing views down onto the northern and southern polar regions. And that's really important because one of the main uh, mission goals of Juno is to study the aurora, so to study the northern lights on Jupiter. Hands up anyone who's seen the northern lights on Earth? A few of you. Oh, good. Okay. You obviously have families that take you on exciting holidays, so good for you. Um, but Jupiter's aurora, Jupiter's northern lights is, is more than 100 times more powerful than those on the Earth. So it's a really spectacular light show. And it tells us a lot about how magnetic fields work. And so that's one of the key, key goals of Juno is to understand that. And also to understand how Jupiter evolved and what's inside Jupiter. We'll come back to that at the very end. Okay. Has anybody in this room, hands up if you've ever made a mistake or got something wrong? Not everybody, really? Okay. Whoever didn't put their hands up and needs to come and speak to me at the end. Um, I should have put my hands up. I absolutely have made loads of mistakes and, and continue to do so. And that's how we learn how we progress. So what I'm showing you on the left is something which used to sit on my desk uh, in my old job in Southampton. And this is um, a piece of a spacecraft called Cluster One which was fished out of a swamp in French Guiana in 1996. So on the top right, I'm showing um, the European Space Agency's spaceport in Karoo in French Guiana, where they launched lots of spacecraft from it. And it's surrounded by tropical swamp. And when the cluster mission launched, there was a software error on board. So a very high tech demonstration of how rocket science is supposed to work. So I'm sure most of you know that when you launch a rocket, it's meant to go straight up. It's not meant to go sideways. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, okay. So there was uh, obviously a lot of software, a lot of computing, which was set up to um, control the launch of this particular spacecraft. And there was one number in there, which defined the vertical velocity of the rocket. But um, any of you who are into coding um, or into, into maths particularly um, will have heard of um, floating point numbers and signed integers. And essentially, one of the software engineers tried to convert um, a floating point number to a 16-bit signed integer, and there wasn't enough uh, space to store that number correctly. So what happened was that the onboard computing system misunderstood the data it was being fed about this vertical component of the velocity and thought that there was a problem. And so instead gave the commands to the rocket to start turning sideways. 
And so 37 seconds after launch, instead of continuing to go upwards, the spacecraft started to tilt and tilt and tilt sideways. And then the aerodynamic forces that were acting on that rocket just split it apart. And a piece of it ended up back on my desk. So what do we learn <clears throat> from that experience? Well, we learned to not give up is the primary answer because what I'm showing you here in the bottom right is cluster two, which was relaunched successfully four years after that initial loss. Um, so they, they regrouped, they were really disappointed of course, and it was a really devastating day for people who were involved in that mission, but they regrouped and they rebuilt and they launched in 2000 and those spacecraft are still orbiting above our heads today, studying Earth's magnetosphere. So, there's no shame in getting something wrong. Um, the only shame is in giving up. But sometimes things go spectacularly right. And here's a video to show you an example of that. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere uh, as we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Yes! Two is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of 1 kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Okay, <clears throat> have any of you seen that movie before? Has anybody seen that? Okay, it's a great one in my opinion. So, you know, what, why have I shown you that? Um, I think that movie is just an amazing illustration of just the joy and the emotion that goes into um, a successful space mission. So the people who we see in that room in Mission Control probably spent a decade or sometimes even two planning that mission, everything from planning out the science goals, as we talked about, to devising all of the engineering, all of the software, all of the mechanical components. And particularly with, with that mission, the detail in terms of the, the deployment of the parachutes and the release of the sky crane and the amount of times when something could have gone wrong is quite stressful to watch, even when you know that it has a successful outcome. So, um, you know, if you take away one thing from today, it's that um, if we want to discover amazing things in the solar system, we have to be brave and we have to take risks. And like I showed you in the previous slide with that explosion, sometimes things go wrong, but that's not the end of the world. So it's amazing to celebrate when engineers and scientists have a huge international collaboration that's as successful as that mission was. Okay. 
So I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the research that my group do. So we work on something called planetary magnetospheres. So we live inside a planetary magnetosphere, the magnetosphere of the Earth, and it protects us from something called space weather. So Earth is like a giant magnet. Um, some of you will have already seen some of the magnets that we have out in the boardroom. If you haven't, you can have a look afterwards. But lots of you, I'm sure, will have studied in science in school what happens when you throw iron filings at a magnet and they sort of trace out the shape um, of the magnetic field lines that go between northern and southern poles. And so Earth and several other planets in our solar system are like giant magnets. And what they do is they protect us from this flow of charged particles, so electrons and ions. This flow is called the solar wind, and it's constantly flowing away from the sun and sort of filling interplanetary space. But the Earth's magnetic field holds off this solar wind and acts like a kind of a giant shield to protect us from it. And so you can see that in this movie at the bottom where you've got the sun emitting this flow, these charged particles that are constantly coming towards us. If we didn't have a magnetic field to protect us, we'd be like Venus or Mars. We would be a, a lifeless, um, a lifeless planet. But instead, um, we have this shield or this kind of umbrella of, of the Earth's magnetic field to hold off that solar wind and to protect us from the most intense radiation from space. Now, there are electrical currents that can uh, flow along these magnetic field lines and produce the aurora, and we'll come back to that in a bit. But those are the systems that myself and my team study. And we, we study them mostly through using uh, data from orbital spacecraft that are flying through these magnetospheres. I introduce magnetospheres because you need to um, understand a little bit about what a magnetic field is to understand the importance of this next discovery. And I've written at the top of this slide, you know, creativity, unforeseen advances. So as I said already, we have mission goals. We have science questions that we want to answer when we send a spacecraft to any planet in our solar system. And so we kind of have a plan of what we want to discover. But sometimes a discovery just comes to us out of the blue. And that happened with the Cassini mission at Saturn. So this moon that I'm showing you on the left is called Enceladus. Hands up anybody who's heard of Enceladus. It's a bit of a niche one, so maybe not too many. Um, so Enceladus is, is one of you know 60 plus moons of Saturn and it's an icy moon, okay? And if you're a geologist or somebody who likes ice, icy moons are, are interesting to understand how, um, how the geology and how, how, how the rocks got to be there. But if you're a space plasma scientist like me or someone who's interested in magnetic fields, generally those kind of icy moons don't hold anything particularly um, special from a magnetic field perspective. But in hindsight, when we look at Enceladus, there is quite something quite weird about it. So if we look at this image of the moon, you can see that the top and bottom parts of it are totally different from each other. So the northern part of it is almost entirely covered by deep, deep craters. So that hold a history of all the stuff that's bashed into this moon over millions and billions of years. But the bottom half of the moon looks totally different. So the bottom half of the moon doesn't have any craters. It's almost totally smooth. And it's just got a couple of these cracks, these blue cracks that have fresh, clean ice near the surface. So initially, when we flew by Enceladus with the Cassini spacecraft, we weren't expecting to do anything other than take images of the icy moon. So we weren't expecting to sample anything strange in the magnetic field. But what actually happened is that we flew past and we noticed that the magnetic field of Saturn, which you can see in this cartoon here, these, these iron filing type magnetic field lines that go from north to south, that magnetic field was being bent near the moon. Shouldn't have happened. So. We flew by again a month later and we saw it again. The magnetic field was definitely, definitely being bent near the moon. And so my boss at the time, uh, Michelle Doherty, she is the principal investigator of the magnetometer instrument on Cassini, immediately flew out to the Jet Propulsion Lab in California and sat down with the Cassini mission planners and said, there is something really strange going on at Enceladus. You need to change the trajectory or the flight path of spacecraft and bring it closer so that we can get a better look. And that's not something that mission planners tend to want to do because they've spent years devising the flight path of their spacecraft and it's, it's not a trivial thing to change. But they did change it. 
and they flew closer. And so after that close flyby and after many, many, many subsequent close flybys, we go from this image of the moon, which gives us a hint that there's something weird going on, to this is the picture that we have now. So we now know that Enceladus has an icy crust and that beneath that southern polar region where we see those blue cracks, we actually have an ocean underneath the surface. And at the bottom of that ocean, we have some kind of interaction that's happening. That's a bit like what you get in the deepest, darkest oceans on Earth at the hydrothermal vents, where you have some really primitive life forms that can potentially thrive. Certainly we see that at the Earth. We don't know whether that's the case at Enceladus right now, but the conditions seem to suggest that it could be. And so with our spacecraft, we've flown through these plumes or these, these geysers, people who've been to, anyone who's been to Iceland or anyone who's been to like Yellowstone Park will have seen geysers here on Earth. That's what we see at Enceladus, these huge um, plumes of material, liquid water mostly coming out of this ocean underneath the surface. So Enceladus and indeed some of the moons of Jupiter, as I'll mention in a bit, are some of the best candidates for potentially having conditions which can support habitability. Now that's quite a long sentence because I'm specifically not saying places that host life currently because we don't know that for sure. Um, but one of the signatures, the chemical signatures that we see in these plumes is molecular hydrogen, which is potentially a byproduct of life. So we are definitely planning to go back and learn more about Enceladus. But that whole discovery chain came about just by seeing a weird bending of the magnetic field. So sometimes nature can surprise us. Okay, um, I brought a book, which um, I appreciate is probably um, a little bit basic for most of this audience. Uh, I borrowed this from my seven-year-old. So lots of you, maybe some of you have younger brothers and sisters, or maybe you still, your parents are compulsive hoarders who never throw anything out. So you still have books like this at home. Do people remember reading books like this at home when you were younger? Maybe some of you still read them. I'm not judging you. So yeah, okay. I love these books. Lots of books about space, which are given to kids, are wrong. And this is one example. So lots of books about space have, you know, tables of numbers in them. And they say, you know, what's the mass of Jupiter or what's inside Saturn or how long is a day on Earth? How long is a day on Jupiter? How long is a day on Saturn? And the, the question of how long is a day, that's a really basic question, right? I mean, we should know that everywhere. We certainly know it on Earth. Um, and we thought we knew it at Saturn, but it turns out we actually didn't. So at Earth, the way that one of the ways that we can measure the length of a day is that we can um, have a satellite that's you know above Dunsink and we can see Dunsink directly below us and then we can set our clock and then we can watch the earth rotate around once and then we can stop our clock and we can see how long that took and that can help us to calculate how long a day is. That doesn't work at Saturn or Jupiter because they're not they don't have a solid surface they're not rocky planets like earth is so we can watch them turn but actually all we're tracking is the cloud tops. So we're not tracking the rotation rate of the deep interior, which tells us how long the day is. So instead what we use at those planets is we use something called radio emissions. So again, some of you in school might've looked at the electromagnetic spectrum, where you look at different wavelengths. So ultraviolet, infrared, um, UV, uh, sorry, um, X-ray and so on. And radio waves are just one part of that electromagnetic spectrum. And radio waves are emitted from magnetic field lines, so always coming back to magnetic fields, they're emitted from these magnetic field lines and they, they pulse quite regularly. So a little bit like if you imagine that I'm the radio source and it's a bit like a lighthouse that's spinning around. So, you know, you see the source of the light and then it then it turns around. I won't turn until I make myself too dizzy. I've done this before in talks and nearly fallen over. Um, but then by the time I spin around again, then you're, you're caught in that full beam again and you can track the rotation that way. And this is just an example of, of how we do that. These, these um, sort of colored blobs are these pulses of radio emission as Saturn is rotating. So when the Voyager spacecraft went past Saturn back in the sort of early 80s, it measured a really regular 
pulsation or really regular rotation of the planet at 10 hours and 39 minutes. And everybody was happy with that. And we assumed that was how long a day was on Saturn. But then 25 years later, when Cassini came along, it also measured a regular pulsing of the emission, but at a different value. So it actually measured something at 10 hours and 45 minutes. There's a diagram of what those pulses look like, just to show you that they were really, really clear. It wasn't an issue with the data analysis. But that can't, neither of those can be correct. Because for a body the size of Saturn, unless there were some big mechanical events that changed how the planet spins, which we're not aware of in, in that 25 year interval, it's just not conceivable that the length of a day would have changed. And so we actually only discovered the length of a day on Saturn back in 2019. By the time the Cassini mission had ended, we had all collected all of the data from 13 years of the mission. <clears throat> and there were some very, very close in orbits at the end of the mission, which allowed us to look at fluctuations in the gravity field and specifically at, at waves in Saturn's rings. And they actually told us that the true length of a day on Saturn is 10 hours and 33 minutes. So neither of these were correct. And this book says 10 hours and 14 minutes. And this is like Osborne, like it's, you know, they're quite good publishers generally. So if any of you have a book like this at home, I would urge you to go and have a look tonight and see what it says for the, the length of a day on Saturn, because unless your book was published post 2019, I suspect that it's wrong. And I'm not kind of trying to be um, snarky about people getting stuff wrong. That's not the point. The point is, is that I think, or one of the things that I love most about being a planetary scientist is the opportunity to change the textbooks. So the textbooks that I read when I was in school are probably different to the textbooks that you are working with now and are different to the textbooks that my very small children are gonna work with. And I love being a part of making those new discoveries and sort of challenging fundamental things that we thought that we knew about the solar system. Okay, so one more thing about what my group does. Um, so any of you have, I guess most of you have learned about energy in school. So you've heard the phrase, energy can't be created or destroyed, but only transferred from one form to another. Everybody heard that phrase? Okay. So one of the things that my group studies is explosive magnetospheres and energy transfer in the solar system. And so I brought a rather cheap um, prop to kind of illustrate what I mean by that. So we're interested in when magnetic field lines snap and when they release energy, but I can use this exercise band to illustrate what I mean. So when I just hold it like this, this is in its kind of lowest energy state, but if I stretch the band, what am I doing? Well, I'm adding potential energy to that system. Okay. I'm transferring energy from my arms to that band. And if I let it go, it's going to snap. It doesn't want to stay stretched. If I stop transferring that energy in and I release it, the energy that has built up that potential energy then becomes transferred into kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Okay. So what happens in magnetospheres? is that we get magnetic field lines becoming really, really stretched and ultimately they snap and they break. And that energy then gets spread into a couple of different pathways. So one pathway is kinetic energy, the energy of motion to move charged particles around. Another pathway is thermal energy or heating of the plasma. And then the third pathway is something called wave particle energy, where some of the energy from where these magnetic field lines have snapped travels along these magnetic field lines into the north and south polar regions and produces the aurora, which some of you have seen when you've been on your holiday. So the next time, if any of you ever get a chance to go and see the aurora in real life, think about that image of a magnetic field line becoming stretched to a point of instability and then snapping and breaking and that energy being translated into the polar regions and then ultimately um, causing those emissions. And just to give you a, a real life example of how that kind of energy transfer can be important, but also quite damaging. Um, is anyone here a fan of Elon Musk? I hope not. No, some people are. OK, that's fine. Um, well, obviously, the, the, maybe some of you saw the SpaceX um, launch yesterday. <clears throat> 
but um, back in February of 2022, so February of last year, um, SpaceX actually, or the Starlink satellites, which they regularly launch, um, they lost 38 of them. And they lost 38 of them because they launched them and they launched them during what we call a space weather event where the sun was emitting a lot of charged particles um, in the direction of the earth and that caused um, a uh, stretching of the earth's magnetic field lines, breaking of the earth's magnetic field lines and a deposition of that wave particle energy into the earth's atmosphere and that caused the earth's atmosphere to heat up and that caused atmospheric drag and that pulled 38 of Elon Musk's satellites back down and caused them to burn up in the atmosphere. So had Elon Musk you know, attended any of my lectures or thought a bit more about how space weather works, he might have been able to avoid losing those 38 satellites. So the impacts of space weather are broad and really varied. It's OK, of course, it's highly relevant for astronauts and, and space professionals. But it's relevant for us too. If any of you ever fly to the US and you're flying over the poles, there is a chance that if there's a big space weather event, um, there might be disruptions to you know, radio frequency navigation. So your flight path might have to be altered. Um, there have been cases in, in recent years where there have been disruptions to electrical grids or there have been power cuts. Um, <clears throat> and nowadays when we're increasingly reliant on things like GPS, um, if if the global telecommunications network went down for even a minute that would just have such an enormous knock-on effect for every kind of industry across the world and so actually now space weather is on the national risk register for loads of different countries and it's just one level down from global pandemic in terms of likely impact so i think we can all agree that global pandemic has a big impact on our daily life and so space weather, while the likelihood of an extreme space weather event knocking out all of the GPS is small, the impact of it happening would be absolutely enormous. And so we have a whole suite of spacecraft orbiting within the Earth's magnetosphere and between the Earth and the Sun, <clears throat> which are seeking to observe, to mitigate, and to ultimately forecast the damaging effects of space weather. But some of the beautiful consequences of space weather include images of the aurora. And so here's Jupiter again, where, as I said, the auroral emissions are, you know, about 100 times more powerful than what we have here on Earth. And we can see them in multiple wavelengths. So coming back again to that electromagnetic spectrum. So we can see them in ultraviolet here on the left. We can see them in X-rays in the middle. And we can see them in infrared. Infrared is like the signature of heating essentially, um, and th those are all different wavelength images of Jupiter. And so the aurora there is really, really dynamic. And Juno, which we, I already showed you this figure, Juno is gonna help us hugely with the study of the dynamic aurora and the study of that wave particle energy by flying right through those magnetic field lines where that wave particle energy is traveling and looking right down onto the aurora of Jupiter. And that's going to unveil a load of those secrets for us. So I want to end with three questions. Um, and these are questions which I think are answerable or certainly tackleable in the next decade. And so they're questions that are relevant for you because they're the kind of questions that if any of you decide to go into space science that you might be tackling. OK, so the first is how is the solar system formed? And actually, uh, what is Jupiter made of? So I come back again, you know, to books like this. So books like this, which will say, um, you know, Jupiter is made of like primarily hydrogen, helium, or they'll say, you know, what Uranus and Neptune are made of. And, you know, that's that's sort of mostly true. Jupiter is made mostly of hydrogen and helium, but actually, we don't know exactly what's going on inside the core of Jupiter. We don't know if it's a solid core. We don't know if it's a liquid metallic um, core. We don't know the full extent and how that interior is kind of spread out or differentiated. And the way that we're going to find that out is with Juno. So this NASA spacecraft, which is at Jupiter right now, 
it's going to be at Jupiter until 2025, and it's going to completely encase the planet in this kind of cosmic net of orbits. And so here's Jupiter from the side, and then Jupiter from above, and then the, the green and the other colored traces are the orbits of Juno. <clears throat> and so Juno is going to cover every single latitude and every single longitude and get every possible view of Jupiter. And it's going to go really close to the planet. And that's going to help us to take really, really high resolution measurements to finally crack the question of what's going on inside Jupiter. And that helps us to understand how the solar system was formed because Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system and has most of the stuff. <clears throat> Second question is what drives explosive magnetospheres? So again, coming back to this image of the field lines becoming stretched to a point of instability and then breaking. And so the question of when that instability kicks off, so essentially how much can you push a magnetic field line before it cracks? Um, the way that we're hoping to answer that question, one of the ways is through looking at the planet Mercury. So Mercury is a small magnetosphere. It's the smallest planet in the solar system, really, really close to the sun. And the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency have a pair of spacecraft um, on the way called Bepi Colombo, and they're going to get there in 2025. So I guess around the time that most of you are maybe thinking of going to university. And so my research group here are working uh, to prepare for the arrival of Becky Colombo and to do a combination of modeling or computer simulation of Mercury, but also to use machine learning. So hands up anyone who's heard the term machine learning or artificial intelligence before, I guess most people. It's really a core, whether you realize it or not, it's a core part of most of your daily lives. If any of you use any kind of social media, if any of you watch YouTube videos, every time you click on something, you're essentially helping the algorithm to learn more about you and learn more about your preferences and learn more about what you like and what you're interested in so that it can then feed you more of the same. And so we use machine learning to analyze spacecraft data. So to analyze data that's already been taken and say, we want to find more measurements that look like this. And so we label measurements that look a certain way. And then we train a computer algorithm to go and find similar things. So very similar to how a lot of the algorithms for social media work. So they learn from your existing choices and they help to make predictions for the future. And then the, the third and final big open question is, you know, are we alone in the universe? Are there other habitable worlds? And so here um, I've got a model of one of Jupiter's moons. So we think that Jupiter's icy moons are the next most likely place in the solar system uh, where we might find life, not human life, but you know, fundamental building blocks of life, microbial life, the kind of life that might exist near hydrothermal vents at the bottom of oceans underneath these moons. So this is a model of one of Jupiter's moons called Ganymede. This is actually what it looks like. It's got a kind of speckly um, surface. But this is the current picture that we have of the moon Ganymede, where we think it has an icy crust, and then it has some kind of a salty ocean and then an ice mantle, maybe, and then a rocky mantle, and then an iron core. And on the 14th of uh, April, just gone, um, ESA, the European Space Agency, launched the JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. And myself and some of my team are involved in that mission. So we went over to Germany to Mission Control to watch, um, watch the launch. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing here is working out how thick that ice crust is, but also how salty the ocean is because the saltiness of the ocean is really a critical factor in whether life can survive and thrive in those environments so juice is on its way to jupiter now it's going to take eight years to get there but then nasa are sending a, a partner spacecraft called europa clipper they're going to launch next year and so in 2030 to 2031 those spacecraft will get to jupiter and again you know that seems like a long way away, but those kind of timescales are relevant for you guys. If this is something that you're interested in, um, you could be the ones who are analyzing the data and figuring out, are there conditions that can support life somewhere other than Earth? So 
I'll finish there with this image, which is one of my favorite images um, from space. It's an image taken by the NASA Cassini spacecraft when it was at Saturn and it turned back in to look towards the inner solar system. And you can hardly see, but Earth and Moon are just, you definitely can't see in this light, but they're just one pixel across in this image. So for me, this image gives us a sense of the scale of the solar system, but also it gives us a sense of the huge technological achievements that, have, that it is to send functional spacecraft all that way away from Earth and to take these amazing images and to take these amazing data that can help us effectively to rewrite the textbooks on space. So I'll stop there and I'll take any questions. Thanks, guys.